Cody, how are you? I'm doing great. How are you guys doing up there? We're good. I, I look at I look at me and my place here in this this dismal room, and then I look at you where you are, and you've got trees and green behind you, and I'm I'm very jealous. Yeah. This, this just happened. It's been raining for three days. So. Is that right? Yeah. This it just opened up. It couldn't have been better timing. Well, that's great. It's um. It's great you say that. I, I think it uh, dovetails well into our discussion today where we're going to um, talk about the just the issue of climate and where our whiskey sits and ages and the various things that we're thinking about and, and uh, um, the, uh, the, the variables that we're thinking about and, and uh, most of which we can't control um, and don't want to control. But you are in Hood River, I'm in Seattle, um, and uh, you've just had three days of rain, you said. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, so, crazy. you know, we're, it's a transition time now in Hood River where uh, we're, it's spring, and, and spring is obviously transitioning from um, uh, the winter to the summer. And um, so basically, uh, here we go, open to the elements, the whiskey rickhouse. So we call our barn a rickhouse, but I'm gonna go into this a little bit more in, in the next few slides. Um, I, I think it's fine to call our, our barn a rickhouse or rickhouse, but we also have some areas of the barn, the lower level in particular, which is closer to what would be called a traditional dunnage type um, uh, environment. So um, let's just go into big climate. So we were talking, Cody, about the change in the climate that's happening right now. You just had three days of rain and now the sun is peeking out and uh, I can see behind you um, some green. Obviously, there's some, a ton of green and, and uh, it, it's spring is one of, well, it probably is my favorite time at the farm um, because of that. You know, you have all of this, you have all this rain, you have a ton of plants that are sitting dormant during the winter time. And then the weather starts to change, it gets more dry, it gets hotter, the days are longer, and things start to grow. And, and uh, you're in the middle of that right now, eh? Yeah, absolutely. Everything is just kind of exploding. Um, the plants that we put into the ground last year, kind of around the house, landscaping wise, are they're just popping off. Everything's growing, everything kind of thrives in this environment out here. Um, which I think speaks to a lot of different things. Even your body is comfortable out here. You know, your skin isn't dry. Um, you don't get to points where you're uncomfortable, you know, and I think just like with yourself and with vegetation, um, things like wine and things like whiskey also thrive in environments like this when they're aging um, because right. they're allowed to kind of sit in that golden area, if you will. Right. Right, so just to give the listeners a, a sort of an idea, um, Hood River is about 45 minutes east of Portland. Um, we are east um, of the mountains. Um, and so we, we are in what would, I mean, we're in a very temperate climate. Uh, west of us is the Pacific Ocean, obviously about two, uh, probably two hours west. And then east of us is, um, is desert really arid desert eastern oregon is very very dry in, in areas and so we're in a real transition area this is mount hood um and uh the cascade mountains well so mount hood is a volcano it's 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 uh it's you know it's not really part of the uh, the the cascade range it's it's a volcano uh, but we are uh, our climate is affected significantly mainly by the Cascade Mountains, which lie to our west. Um, and so where we are, we experience uh, four real seasons. Um, we have a, a winter season that is cold with precipitation that is uh, a, a, the highest of the year. Um, we probably, I think we're about six to eight inches of rain a month uh, during the wet time. And then during the dry season, uh, August, uh, uh, July, August, uh, it, it, it is much more dry than that. So, and we have everything in between. We have uh, the springtime, which we're in now, which is a transition time. And it's becoming much more uh, warm. The, the, the days are obviously getting longer. We're just about to, to hit the longest day of the year now in June. 
And, um, you know, like you just experienced, Cody, you've had three days of rain and now you're, well, I think you're going to have more rain coming up in the next few days, but this afternoon, it sounds like it's clear and it's more warm and, and it looks amazing there. Yeah. Yeah. We are supposed to get some more rain. I mean, as is with the Northwest, it'll be sunny for about an hour. And then the next four hours, you're just going to be underneath the water. Yeah. Oh, is that right? Uh, that's how it always kind of seems to go. Yeah. But yeah, so I mean, these these um, these major climate factors or variables are are a huge part of what um, makes whiskey our whiskey uh, unique. Um, and so, uh, like I said, we experienced four proper seasons, and we're in the transition season now. Um, but basically, let's go to the next slide there now. Our barn sits in a, uh, uh, an area that is basically the foothills of Mount Hood. Mount Adams is just to our north across the Columbia River. And you can see by this slide that we do get snow. It's not super common. We probably, I, I would say on average, we have snow at the farm for a month, maybe month and a half. It does vary. We've had some really cold winters with snow that was four, you know, four months or three, four months. And then I think we've had winters too where there was no snow. And then we go all the way to the summers where it's very hot, probably average highs are in the low 80s and uh, much more dry. Um, and so right now we're transitioning, we're in the springtime obviously in the Northern hemisphere and, and our whiskey now, the average temperature of our whiskey is above 45 degrees Fahrenheit. And, and so things start to happen. Things start to open up. The barrel, the wood starts to open up. There's an increase in the pressure within these casks and that's driving whiskey into the deeper layers of the wood. And so um, tastes really start to evolve much more rapidly now than they would have, um, you know, two, three months ago. Um, and so this is a very, very, this is the time where we start to plan for our, our whiskeys, our releases. Um, uh, things lay much more dormant. They don't change a whole lot in the winter, but now things are starting to change and evolve. And uh, we need to now start to plan and watch closely. So um, you, Cody, are, are you have a number of things that you're watching closely. I know batch three finishing casks are happening. We're also, we've been talking about cask uh, strength releases that are, are opening up. And uh, um, can you tell us a little bit about those those uh, those expressions that you're keeping an eye on right now? Yeah, absolutely. So, you know, I think there's <clears throat> three big ones that are coming right now. Um, the batch three, uh, which we started here about, it's a little over two months ago now, uh, about nine weeks. Um, and as you guys know, um, the port barrels that we are using have different levels of um, characters still left in them that we can extract from. Um, so one of our barrels that we uh, put into, you know, had achieved what we were looking for rather quickly. So we've moved that whiskey out of that barrel. Um, and the whiskey that was a little bit slower, the things that we were looking for it to pick up um, were things that we were finding in that barrel that we were using previously uh, for aging that, that batch of batch three. Uh, so we've moved that over. Um, and since it started to warm up just a touch, um, and be a little bit more consistently above 65 out here um, day to day. We've started to see more red fruit notes pick up in that whiskey as well that we've switched over into that barrel. So um, we're getting everything that we were kind of looking for uh, by doing that. Uh, the next one is the batch four release that fall, uh, which is a straight bourbon barrel finish. Um, and everything that we're seeing from those barrels downstairs in more of a cellar like uh, environment is, is kind of what we were hoping for. You know, they've matured now for six plus years um, and they've taken on a lot of these notes and flavors. And you can just kind of see that by putting them all together, uh, it's gonna be a really beautiful expression of kind of a pure American single malt that's achieved a decent age statement. Um, and then, you know, our, uh, our single cask release, um, which is something that everybody's been super interested in. Uh, we just put that into blending tank about a week ago now. Um, it's almost a week. And, you know, there was really nothing left to achieve there. I think we all kind of agreed when we tasted it that it was an outstanding whiskey on its own. Um, and it'll be, it'll be a really big treat for our consumers and our followers to, 
to be able to experience that as well if they get their hands on it. So one of the things, um, there's a few things I wanted to talk about at, at, in, this, uh, in this section. And, you know, one of the, the big thing that we're trying to do with these various whiskeys is basically, um, I wouldn't say lead them along, but um, follow them along and not get in their way uh, to their final taste. And we have a number of tools at our disposal. I'm going to focus on the climate type tools for today, but um, I just wanted to describe for the listener the differences in our, uh, what we call our rec house. Rick house so I should, uh, you know, rick house is a funny term. Not everybody's familiar with it. It's spelled R-I-C-K-H-O-U-S-E. There, I, I, I actually could not find, and, I, and I'm probably not looking in the right place, but I could not find a clear definition of rick house, but it basically is a word that comes from the main word, rick which is a stack of, of typically a stack of wood in the open um, and uh, we're stacking wood or barrels or casks uh, um, out in the open in our barn um, and so typically you would refer to a um, an aging facility for whiskey where there were barrels stacked on top of one another on racks typically a, a rick house or a rack house um, and, and that is a great way to age whiskey. We have the upper two floors, we're only using one of them yet, um, that would be, I, I think would be what one would consider a, a classic rickhouse type environment. That would be the, the main floor of our, of, our, of our distillery. The lower floor is, um, there are some characteristics of it that you would expect in a rickhouse. So we have barrels that are stacked on top of each other with racks, but it is, um, it, it's somewhat temperature controlled in that about half of the, of the area of that um, floor is underground. And so, and it's also concrete, it's, it's, it's got a concrete floor. Um, and so the swings in temperature are much less um, and it's much cooler in the summer and, and less cold in the winter. And uh, that would be what some people would call it uh, more of a dunnage type uh, or dunnage style uh, aging facility, uh, more the traditional scotch type dunnage uh, uh, facility where things would be in a single layer, they'd be close to the ground, typically in a classic dunnage style. I think people would say it would be a um, more natural type floor rather than concrete. But rather than things being temperature controlled, or sorry, rather than things being expo exposed to the big swings in temperature, um, it's, 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 there's less shifts. It's more of a cellar type uh, situation. And so, um, and, and the other, the main thing that we, I just wanted to touch on here too, was also the importance of, of keeping these many areas clean and, and free of anything else that is odorous. These barrels are porous, they're, they're wood, and they allow oxygen and, and uh, um, other uh, uh, chemicals to pass through them, or molecules to pass through them. And so one of the main things that we're always on each other for is to keep the place clean. So we, have, we don't have any cleaning solvents in the, in the, in the uh, distillery. We, we keep, we keep the, the hoses off the ground. Um, it's a big thing to keep that environment clean and, and just free of anything that would be off-putting, any, any off-putting senses. So Cody, one of the things I wanted to ask you about was how we are learning to use these different floors of the distillery uh, to, to move things along and, and help this, these whiskeys be what they want to become. Yeah, <clears throat> um, and I think that's one of the exciting things you know, for us right now in this company in general, um, watching our production um, and how how these different floors and the different temperatures and different humidities that we're experiencing on the levels are affecting the whiskey inside the barrel and which barrels are actually showing um, their best on which level, uh, which I think was really interesting about a week or two ago when you guys were down here at the farm um, and we got to taste through the Canton barrels especially. Um, and seeing how the Canton barrels, which is a just toasted barrel, uh, there's no char going on the inside, um, and how different that was between the cooler temperature downstairs and what we were experiencing upstairs. 
And something that really kind of struck in me as well when we were tasting, um, I mean, that young spirit, it's about what, a little over two years old now, um, upstairs. It reminded me a little bit of the texture that we had seen off of the batch two um, that we had left upstairs in the rum barrels. There's almost kind of like this creamy marshmallow texture that you're getting from the hot heat um, and these barrels that are either neutral or just toasted. Um, and it's, it's a discovery for us, you know, it's, it's one of those things where we're um, experiencing these things and figuring out where things are going to fit the best. Um, it's really a puzzle. Um, so um, as we go on and as we keep experimenting and learning and um, going through new finishing barrels and um, typically, you know, we're using our finishing barrels upstairs to kind of speed up that process and get what we're looking for the most out of the barrel uh, because heat does lead to further extraction. Um, yeah, our, our process is just going to change the more we learn and we'll dial it in better and better and better as we go. So it'll be exciting to watch how we evolve um, the more we learn. Typically, um, Sash, you can, yeah, just uh, advance the slide there if you don't mind. But typically what we want, some of the sort of concepts that we keep in mind is, you know, if you, if you think about bourbon and rye, where they're typically, well, bourbon, I would say, traditionally is aged in the American South, where, where things are much hotter in the summer than I would think they would be, in, in, even in Hood River. Um, and more typically in those areas, you will be extracting more of the tannins from these casks. Um, you'll be creating uh, a, a much, uh, more of the acidic type molecules. Um, and so the, the sharp acidic type tastes are what we would expect to see in the hotter areas of, of the barn. Um, and those can be great. I mean, we, we uh, you know, we, we like those types of flavors to, to a point, um, but we have to be careful. Downstairs in the more dunnage, I would say, type area of our, of our distillery, things move slower. A cask, like you were saying, that Canton Cooperage cask, that is a, um, it, it's a different appearance. It has a much tighter grain. It's a much, uh, it's, it's more akin to a wine barrel than, a, than I would say a traditional bourbon cask. Um, heavily toasted, very lightly, if any char at all. It was not moving very well on that lower dunnage type area. And um, once you move it upstairs, like you were saying, Cody, on that main floor, with the heat and um, the lower humidity, um, things really now have started to, to, to move in, in a good direction. But I would, imag I would imagine we have to be careful about it. You know, we have to, we have to, make, we have to pay attention to what's happening because we can overdo some of it. Would you agree? Absolutely, yeah. Um, you know, I think it was kind of like we were saying before, at what point do we need to move it back downstairs? Yeah. Uh, and be really careful about what we're getting out of upstairs because there is a point where you can go too far. Um, and the way our whiskey works after a few years in new oak barrels by then going into ex bourbon barrels, um, I feel like it lays a really, really strong base for what we're going to then build off of um, downstairs in the ex bourbon barrels. I wonder, I wonder too, you know, we, we've done some experiments on our own, but you know, my, my feeling is the, especially some of the really uh, multiple used ex bourbon casks that we're using where there's very little extraction going to happen in those casks. I wonder if we're going to see a different, and, and, and I think what we're mainly, what we're mainly um, uh, uh, ex uh, experiencing there or benefiting from is the oxidative type uh, reactions. Yeah. Um, there may be some extraction as well. I think there are some molecules that are broken down probably by a, an oxygen dependent uh, uh, process. But, um, you know, it'll be it'll be it'll be fun to see over time, even in those neutral casks, the difference between the two floors, you know, yeah. and, and how the hot because, you know, those oxidative type um, uh, processes are 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 definitely uh, heat or uh, temperature dependent. And, um, you know, I wonder what we will see in the differences, even in those neutral casks between the, the, the more dunnage, cooler type uh, environment lower down than the, the warmer, more traditional rec house type environment up above, you know? Yeah, absolutely. 
Um, I'm also really curious to see if we ever decide to begin one of those ISC barrels off upstairs as well and really give that a couple good seasonal cycles um, to see where that would end up. Um, right. Yeah. Yeah. I, I agree. And I, I mean, those are wonderful casks. They're, um, there's a ton of flavor to extract from them. I, I, uh, I think particularly since we're using a heavily toasted, lightly charred, we have a ton of, uh, of flavor to extract. Um, but, you know, as you mentioned, uh, we just have to keep a closer eye on it. Things move more quickly, especially this time. Well, especially as we get into the July, August time of year. Um, and, uh, you know, we talked a little bit last time about the sort of orphan cask that we lost track of that, that had whiskey sitting in that new oak cask for longer than we had, uh, than we thought. And, um, and the fact that it's turning out amazing, you know, you know, I, I, I keep saying that we, we want to balance flavors and we want to, um, not overdo it with the various types of casks, especially those new casks. But, you know, as, as we saw with that, uh, with that cask, that sort of orphan cask that sat there for an extra year, as long as it's given that time in the more neutral oxidative type stage, it can be quite nice, you know? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So we'll, we'll, we'll have to see. And uh, um, um, yeah, like you say, looking at those ISC casks and, and seeing them in the more warm uh, environment of the upper floor will be super fun. Um, but let's go on to the next one. So, um, so this is a very, uh, this is an interesting topic. Uh, Nancy Fraley was a big, um, a big influencer of mine and still is. She's a very knowledgeable woman. And, and uh, I, I was, uh, I was able to spend a, a time with her and other people um, picking her brain on various topics as they pertain to maturing whiskey and blending whiskey. And, and one of the things that I found really interesting was this whole concept of, you know, the right time to remove whiskey from a cask. Um, I, I think the thing that this sort of speaks to is this, this whole um, life of a cask throughout the year, you know, or, or the whiskey in a cask throughout the year. The fact that during those cold winter months when things are, are uh, colder uh, in, in Hood River, they're generally more humid. Um, things are not, the whiskey tastes different. Uh, it's, it's the, the barrels are closed, the wood is generally closed. We're not getting the higher pressure. We're not getting the high temperature that pushes whiskey into the, to, into the deeper fibers and layers of those uh, uh, wood staves. And then in the spring, like now, that really, changes and now things start to open up just like the various flowers and so on that are on the farm and um, this would be a more uh, as we're approaching now the early summer um, now we start to get into a time when uh, putting casks in blending tanks like you're doing down there uh, Cody is more appropriate um, and, but would you agree with that Cody this whole idea of of this time of year, the whiskey being quite different than it would have been three, four months ago during the colder uh, winter months? Oh, absolutely. <clears throat> um, I think the, uh, the run that we just barreled with Virginia is a really cool example of that. Um, you know, it's been in barrel now for what, just over four months. We barreled in mid-January with that. And you can already kind of see in the last month and a half or so, the color is starting to come in and take effect and you're starting to see small changes in the nose start to evolve already uh, just as we start to warm up and open up um, and I think that's one of the beauties of having a non-temperature controlled site and being subject to the elements um, is that just like our environment around us the whiskey is reacting in a very similar way um, it's something that I've always thought was really beautiful with places like biodynamic wineries and things like that that rely solely on um, their environment to get things done. Um, and it's something that I, I think people have a really hard time replicating when you do get into temperature controlled and humidity controlled environments. Like you can put it in as much as you want, but it's really difficult to get something that's as unique as your season. You know, seasonality is an almost uh, replicable, if you will. Yeah, it's it's so true, and and uh, you know it was it, it's uh, it's I I I keep you know luck plays a big big role in so many things, and um, 
I, I would not have known uh, that Hood River, you know, one of the things we, we, we've talked a lot about temperature and climate in the Hood River Valley and also temperature microclimate within our barn. But the other thing is humidity. You know, we, we, are, we benefit from an amazing humidity, not just because it's pleasant to live in. <laughs> we don't, we're not too dry, we're not too humid, but that also is a very nice place for whiskey to sit. Um, humidity, uh, if the humidity is too high, you'll get mold, musty flavors developing, especially in the, the darker, cooler areas of, 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 the, of the aging facility. And, and then the opposite as well. I mean, there are places I know that we all know of that are quite hot and dry for a lot of the year. And they really do struggle with evaporate, evaporative loss and, um, and, and also just flavors that can be quite uh, sharp and, and acidic uh, in, in those hot, hotter type environments. And uh, so, yeah, it, it is quite nice that we, you know, not only is the Pacific Northwest a very pleasant place to live, um, but I think as a result of, of that, it's, it's also a really nice, pleasant place for whiskey to, 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 to evolve and, and, and become, become what it wants to be, you know? And uh, so humidity is the other thing. Um, but yeah, we're, we're, uh, we're now uh, entering a part of the year where our whiskey is above 60 degrees Fahrenheit on average, becoming that anyways. It's not quite, it's probably not quite there, is it, Cody? What would you say the temperature of the whiskey is now? Uh, I checked yesterday. It was fifty-four and a half. Yeah, so we're just starting so to get. Getting... I would I would imagine the probably the average highs now are probably in the mid to mid sixties, high sixties. Would you say? Well, it's, I mean, we've kind of had a weird little spring. It's teased us a whole bunch. You know, we've got we've had weeks where we get up into the seventies and then we dip right back down into the mid fifties, low sixties. Um, which is kind of like this week. You know, it was after a nice warm weekend, we dipped right back down. Um, but we're headed back up, and I hope, hope this is the last one. <laughs> right. Yeah, you, you know, that's right. Um, but on the other hand, when we have those super hot, dry times stretches as well, um, it's, it's not always the best thing. Things move yeah. too quickly. We lose a lot from evaporation. Um, but I hear what you're saying. Yeah, it's, it's – uh, but, you know, I, I, I think – the other thing to touch on as well is the, those fluctuations, those those periods like you talk about where things are really hot and, and nice, like low 70s is a super pleasant temperature to be in. Um, those are great to be in, obviously, but when, it, when things cool down, it's that fluctuation as well that really makes things nice and move along in a good way. Um, and, I, you know, I th we don't we don't deal with those super, those prolonged, super hot, dry periods. And so. We don't have, we don't see as much of those really sharp, acidic type tastes coming out as as much, you know, as I think we would if we were in a, a hotter, drier part of even Oregon, you know. Yeah, absolutely not. Phil, I'm going to interrupt, and there's quite an amusing thing going on in the chat where there's a there's some wages being placed on um, who out of you, Cody and Gregor, um, could get on a single lungful the the most out of the Valanche or the the whiskey thief. So. <laughs> Just wanted to throw that in there that um, when this is all over, I think we need to, the, you know, COVID is done and we can gather. That could be quite a fun little uh, wager to place between the three of you. My money, of course, is on you, my love. <laughs> so is this basically using the barrel thief as a straw? Basically. Oh. Okay. Is, this, is, this a, is this a drinking game we're talking about here? It's just a wager between a Scot, uh, an American, and a Canadian. Uh, <laughs> I didn't want to interrupt, but I thought that was pretty funny. <laughs> That's awesome. We've never done that, and I, I don't know if I actually want to try and win that wager. Yeah, right. So. I may not say the best right thing. <laughs> anyway, sorry, continue. <laughs> uh, no, well, I mean, those were, those were the main points that I think, Cody, were there other things that you wanted to, uh, to bring up? I mean... <clears throat> I think we touched on just about everything. I think the other thing that we would be able to bring up though and talk about, which is pretty cool, is that um, like we were saying this whole time, our humidity out here um, and in other places, it can really affect things like your ABV in the flavor. And so when you're going into barreling and something I think is cool that we were talking about with Clear Creek, you know, in this estate run that we just did um, this year as well, 
and the things that they experience in their barrel room from corner to corner, from bottom to top, um, and how they have to plan for that when they go in and they make the run and they're trying to hit a certain ABV so that they know um, that after four years in barrel, if it's too dry, the humidity is too low, that they're going to be burning off the water and the ABV is going to go up. And so they're planning for that. Um, and for us, it's, it's kind of beautiful that we're in an area that we can't control. But what we're seeing is a very consistent level uh, for our ABV and there's not a whole lot of change. Uh, and it's, that is fun. It is fun, and 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 that's pro that's a combination of temp and humidity that that's that's doing that. Is that right? Would you agree? Absolutely, it's a magical balance, and it's something that I feel like everything feels out here, and it makes it a very very great environment for aging whiskey and anything in general. I think it would all thrive if we decided to do it. You know. Yeah, it it is quite amazing. The other thing that I didn't mention about the location of the uh, of the ra of the distillery is that it's in a bit of a valley. Um, our, our property is, is located in a valley. And, and I think because of the, the winds that can blow, that barn, and actually both barns, were put down low in that valley. And so we also don't get those dry blowing winds in, in the summertime as well, which I would imagine would have a pretty big impact on our, our evaporative losses. Um, Absolutely. Yeah. And, uh, and then also in, in the wintertime, you know, it's, it's sort of down in a, in a, a low ground and uh, we don't get those cold whistling winds that, that freeze things up. We will get into freezing sometimes, but um, it's, uh, it's funny, even just up in Parkdale, like, uh, you know, <laughs> five minutes towards Mount Hood, it's a much different winter. I mean, they'll, they'll predictably have snow for three, four months, and whereas will be a month, maybe or two, you know, it's 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 quite remarkable the changes in, in temperature and climate, even just like five, ten minutes down the road. Yeah, I agree. It's pretty cool. It is it is good, and uh, it'll it'll be nice to show people if if and when they get a chance to come to the farm, just to see the layout and where it is. Um, and, you know, I, I wish we could take credit for how we 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 have where the place is, but we basically put the distillery where that barn was originally built. And um, I, I think people can make most things work for them if they try hard enough, but it's nice that we don't have to work too hard with our environment, you know? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> that worked out well. <laughs> it, did, it did work out well. Uh, Sash, were there any questions for Cody or I? Yes, one just coming through here, um, and um, Blake is asking, he says, probably a dumb question. Blake, there is never a dumb question, but no he says, question. is there ever any worry about condensation or anything freezing in the barrel? Well, the alcohol content's too high for things to freeze, um, but we do have, well, we have pipes, <laughs> and we do have, to worry <laughs> about the, we do have to worry about the pipes sometimes. Those freeze. Those do freeze, and we've had that happen. Um, uh, but not not the casks. The alcohol content is too high for things to freeze. Um, well, it would I, I don't know exactly the temperature we'd have to get down to. Or that you could get down to a freezing temperature, but it's much lower than what we experience. So not for the spirit. Um, and uh, so that you know, the cold is not an issue for us. The the, the, the major issue with the cold is just as we were saying. The, the taste, the, the whiskey, the casks, they, I think what we would, the best description would be that they go dormant. Um, the, the grain closes down, the, the, the pressures decrease in the cask, and um, things just slow down. And so generally in those colder months, we don't want to be messing with the whiskey. We, we don't, we certainly don't want to be blending and bottling. It would be very, very hard to achieve the same taste that we would have gotten in the summer or spring or summer or fall. Um, and uh, so we just leave them alone. And, and, uh, and then, but we, when things start to move like March, April, like we've just gone through, um, that's when the fun really starts. We start to really think about where whiskey is placed, what we're trying to achieve, what we need to achieve. Um, and uh, yeah, and we keep learning, you know, Cody and I, we, 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 we keep an eye on things. We we're doing our little experiments uh, with nosing mainly uh, throughout the year, and uh, 
and we keep learning, you know, and, and I think as, as we get to use more of that burn as well, as time goes on, uh, we'll have even more tools at our, at our discretion uh, also. So um, it's, it's super fun to, to learn these things. Uh, would, would you agree, Cody? Absolutely. I mean, we're just, this company is so young. Um, and I feel like that's another thing to keep in mind is we have three batches out, but it's still just a baby. Um, and as we continue to grow and learn and um, experiment, which is, you know, tough for us to do because we have such a small margin of error on anything that we do. Um, but we're just, you know, going to uncover the secrets that are out there in that barn that it has to give to us. Um, and it's exciting. It it's is why we, fun. Why we get into this. Yeah, it is super fun, you know, and, and, um, you know, I don't, I don't like, to, I mean, I guess we could call, we, we, we do make mistakes and errors, but, and, you know, underlying all these things that I call experiments, we are sticking to some basic principles that, um, you know, I think as long as we stick to them and, and, uh, you know, sort things like wood quality, size of cask, the, 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 the early things too, the distillation fermentation, but, you know, in this particular part that we're talking about, the aging, as long as we stick to principles, the likelihood we're going to end up with something that tastes bad, I think is low. Um, I think that there are just gradients of, of amazing is the way I look at it. <laughs> exactly. Well, sorry, Phil, I, I, when you were talking, when um, we had that question about um, freezing, it made me think about the conversation that you and I had had about um, chill filtered um, oh yeah, and and uh, and cold temperatures, and I think maybe everyone would love to get your take and uh, and and maybe a quick explanation of chill filtered and and how or why it could apply to us and 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 why we may or may not choose to do it. Well, basically, chill filtering is when you cool the the uh, whiskey down prior to bottling it, and you pass it through a filter. Uh, the longer chain fatty acids come out of solution. When you pass it through a filter of a certain size, you extract those fatty acids. And, and you know, purists, many of the American single malt producers feel that chill filtering something re removes some of the tastes and even the mouth feel um, that that you you otherwise would 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 uh, would would like. Uh, but then on the other hand, um, if you put an ice cube in a whiskey that has not been chill filtered it will be hazy and even if you have a bottle that hasn't been chill filtered uh and and things come out of solution um in the bottle you'll get sediment in the bottle and people that that can be off-putting for some people um and, and so i you know i i i uh i don't have a strong feeling either way i i think there are pros and cons of each we we don't chill filter our whiskey and uh, um, uh, we, we've liked the results so far, um, but uh, yeah, I think there can be an argument made either way. Uh, um, you know, typically when, when I enjoy our whiskey, I, I, I don't typically put an ice cube in it. I, I'll, I'll, I'll sometimes dilute it, especially batch two, because it's a bit strong. Um, and, and But, you know, uh, people can put an ice cube in it. It's just because it has not been chill filtered, some of those fatty acids, those longer chain molecules that have not been filtered out, will come out of solution, and uh, and that's okay. It's uh, you know I, I I think it adds to the mouthfeel um, when you're drinking it, but um, yeah, that's the deal with chill filtering, and and um, so yeah, would you add anything to that, Cody? I mean, do you? I don't know if you have a strong feeling either way, but what is your sense on it? Um, well, my sense I think starts to come from more of like a public perception first type area where I feel like a lot of serious drinkers and connoisseurs out there and whiskey lovers are asking for more of the raw product. You know, we get this big push for things like barrel strength and unchill filtered and unfined uh, product. And it's, it extends even further past the spirits world. You know, it goes into the wine world as well, but I feel like it's more of the consumer trying to further educate themselves and really get down into what is the real product? You know, they don't want to see the veil. They don't want to see all the fluff and all of that that sometimes people will add to their product because they feel like that's what they need to create a good product, um, which I think is exciting. It's an exciting turn to see the consumer want those things. Um, and I think it's really important because it means that people are becoming more educated and they're becoming more nerdy. And that's what we all want in the end. <laughs> totally. 
it is nice. I mean, it's nice that people are paying attention. You're totally right. And uh, um, yeah, I think here at Wanderback, we have an open mind where we don't, we don't try to uh, push our agenda any more than we need to. Um, we don't, uh, we don't chill filter. We might in the future, but, but currently we've kept things very, uh, uh, you know, non-processed. And we consider that a level of processing that we don't really need and don't really want. And we think that the taste that we have from non-chill filtering is good. Um, but yeah, we don't have a strong opinion uh, against it. Uh, it's just, um, or, or, or either way. Um, so, yeah. Can, can I hop in again? Um another comment saying i noticed batch number one is 45 percent doesn't that haziness come in about above 46 percent so there would be a chance is that right yeah so the more alcohol the more soluble those molecules are um, and vice versa oh. um, so temperature alcohol content all play a role in the soluble uh, nature of certain certain molecules and so uh, yes, that's absolutely right. Uh, it wasn't why we chose that uh, ABV, that that proof. Um, that was more of a taste thing, and and um, I think in the future we will have varying proof uh, strengths for our our whiskey. Um, but uh, yeah, very good point. Definitely somebody asking there who knows what they're talking about. Um, <laughs> and uh, yes, so alcohol content, ABV does play a role in the solubility of certain molecules like the fatty acids we're talking about here. Thank you. Great. Well, let's, uh, I think we'll clue it up. You know, I, I get the sense that, um, well, at least me in, in, in any, any, any ways, is, is this COVID thing is starting to drag on. It's, it's having an effect on everybody. And, and, uh, that's to be expected. Um, I hope everybody's taking care of themselves. I know that uh, it's hard. We're, this is not a new thing anymore. This is just a pain in the butt thing now, I think, for a lot of people. And uh, I hope everybody stays safe. Uh, I hope you enjoy our drink responsibly, obviously. And, and uh, I look forward to when we can all get together, either at the farm or somewhere else, and, and uh, share stories about the whiskey and everything else. Uh, but I know this is this is wearing on for many many people. So I, I hope you all stay healthy and take care of yourselves. And uh, we look forward to seeing you all very soon. Absolutely. Thank you, Cody. Thank you, Phil. Um, thanks everyone who's been listening, and we look forward to seeing you next week. Thank you, guys. Have a good evening. Cheers. See Cheers. you.